<laughs> well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today for this uh, special uh, Zoom talk. Um, as you know, we have occasional talks organized by the parish and it's great that you can be with us this evening, even though England are playing Albania um, as we talk. Uh, I'd like to especially welcome Tony Mitchell, who's very kindly agreed to give this talk. Um, Tony is a, a regular contributor to our local history society. I mean, he helps organize all the events and talks and gives lots of very interesting presentations about our local history. Um, and in fact, this evening's talk is uh, something that he's shared with the local history society a few months ago about a very interesting local lady um, who uh, has lots of local connections. I won't say too much about her though, because Tony is going to tell us all about her over the next um, half an hour, 40 minutes or so. So without further ado, Tony, over to you. Right, thank you very much. I'll try to remember what to do. Right, share screen. Go on to... <laughs> Perfect. And that should come up larger. There we go. Brilliant. Right. Yes, just a bit of background information. I've been um, Dutch Ridge Local History Society for about 10 years. And in August 2019, my wife Carol and I and a number of friends were on holiday in Chroma. And whilst we were there, we received an email from a certain Father Nicholas Schofield, the parish priest. Now, he's a member of our local history society. And he said in his email that on Tuesday, the 3rd of September 2019, he would be involved in the blessing of a memorial in honour of Cape Marsden in the Hillingdon and Uxbridge Cemetery. Well, he gave a few details about this lady and said that amongst those attending the ceremony would be the Deputy, Deputy Mayor of Hillingdon, the Russian Orthodox Bishop in London, and a Siberian television crew. He, he suggested to the organisers that a representative of Uxbridge Local History Society should be involved. Now, we had never heard of Kate Martin, and neither had our, soci our society's chairman and local historian, Ken Pierce, but we were intrigued and after discussing it with uh, our chairman it was decided that my wife Carol and I would attend the ceremony so we advised the organizers accordingly and having been to the ceremony I thought that local people should know that in their local cemetery there's a grave of someone who they've probably never heard of but who deserves their recognition so I put together this talk um, to give Uxbridge Local History Society on Zoom uh, during the COVID lockdown period. And since then, I've given, given it to a few other organisations, so uh, now it's your turn. By the end of my talk, I hope you will have realised why this lady needs more recognition, and perhaps you'll also have learnt some geography and history that you may not have known before. Journey across Siberia, the remarkable story of Cape Marsden. Well, this picture is not of a monument in Hillingdon and Dutchbridge Cemetery. It's one erected in 2014, 7,000 miles away in the small village of Sosnovka in Siberia. It was commissioned by the local people in remembrance of an English nurse who did a lot for their community. 120 years ago. It shows her name, Kate Marsden, but who was she? And incidentally, I don't know whether you can make out down the bottom here, they have spelt her name incorrectly, but it's difficult to correct typos when they've been carved in stone. On the 3rd of September, 2019, Carol and I drove to the, to the cemetery and we parked near the chapel but there was no one else about whatsoever. We wandered around for a while and then a few people started to arrive. Unfortunately, we recognized Father Nicholas and knew we were at the right place. We were led to the grave, which was on the edge of the cemetery. 
and we were all given a little booklet, which amongst other information listed the organizers, the sponsors, 17 honored guests, and two acknowledged guests. Now, I don't know the difference between honored guests and acknowledged guests, but the only two acknowledged guests were the two from Oxbridge Local History Society, namely myself and my wife, who was given the name Claire Mitchell. Um, it's really Carol, but we can forgive them for getting her name wrong because I think we were the last people to confirm our attendance. Now, here's one of the photographs that uh, I took showing the most important people of those attending. I know most of them, but uh, not all of them. So let me just uh, run through a few people. Now, the first on the left here is from St. Francis Leprosy Guild. I believe it's Philip Neville, one of their trustees, but I, I can't be absolutely certain of that. Second from the left is Anton Alexandrovich Chesnikov. He's the director of the Russian Culture House in Kensington High Street. They host events promoting Russia. And shortly after the consecration of the ceremony, they hosted an event about Kate Marsden. And I very much regret not saying I would attend. Then at the front here is Mr. S. A. Musalimas, one of the two organizers of the event. He obtained a direct, uh, sorry, a doctorate of philosophy at Oxford University, and he is a professor at the Northeast Federal University in Yakutsk in Siberia. Fourth from the left here is Alexandra Igorovich Novikov. He is first secretary in the press office of the Russian Embassy in London. He's probably the man that uh, has to convince the British press that there's nothing wrong with some of the things that uh, Russia get up to. Next, the lady in the white dress is the other organizer, organizer of the event. She is Svetlana Yegorova Johnston. She's a researcher at the Russian Academy of Sciences and a lecturer at Yakut State University in Siberia. Then, of course, we have Father Nicholas Schofield, who needs no introduction to you. And as I said, he's a member of our local history society. He knows far more about Kate Marston than I do. He had an article about her published in the Catholic Times. To the right of Father Nicholas is His Grace Matthew, Bishop of Soros Russian Orthodox Church in London. He was officiating at the consecration ceremony. Now, next is an interesting lady, Kathleen Leonard. She was the representative from the Long Riders Guild. Now, they are the world's first international association of equestrian explorers, and it's a, an invitation only organization. It was formed in 1994 to represent men and women of all nations who have ridden more than 1,000 continuous miles on a single equestrian journey. And I think Kathleen was able to join the Guild after riding from the north of Scotland to her home in Cornwall, just under 900 miles by direct road routes, but you can't ride a horse on motorways. She clocked up an extra 100 miles or so by taking other roads and a few detours using bridle ways. Next is Teji Barnes. At the time, she was deputy mayor of Hillingdon. She was mayor the following year. She was there with her daughter, who's not in the picture. Uh, she was standing with us at the time. The person to the right of Teji Barnes is, I believe, another representative from the Russian Orthodox Church, um, but I don't think he was named on the guest list, so I, I can't offer a name for him. Next is Father Desmond Bannister, the parish priest of All Saints Church in Long Lane, Hillingdon. And then the next four young ladies are all from Yakutsk in Siberia. And they may all be from the film company Arctic Film, which was making a documentary about Kate Marsden. The one in the black dress here um, is Tamara Obutova. She's the project manager and producer of the film. And she's also an actress in the Saka Theatre in Yakutsk. 
Finally, the lady in the white top. Now on my screen, I can only see part of her um, because our pictures uh, cover her a little bit, but uh, that lady is Sheila Pereira. Uh, she's an administrator, or she is the administrator at St. Francis Leprosy Guild in London. And I understand she's retiring from that position at the end of this year. Carol, my wife and I met her a couple of weeks ago in St. George's Cathedral in Southwark, where there was a mass to celebrate the 125th anniversary of St. Francis Leprosy Guild. So what did Kate Marsden do to warrant a gathering of all these Russian people from the embassy and church in London and from Yakutsk in Siberia, together with the church leaders from our own community, our deputy mayor, a lady from the Long Riders Guild and representatives from the St. Francis Leprosy Guild. And of course, others who are not in my photo, including myself and Carol from Uxbridge Local History Society. Now, in 1891, English nurse Kate Marsden made a gruelling 11,000 mile trek across Siberia in search of a rare herb purported to cure leprosy. She was born in Edmonton, Edmonton in London on the 13th of May, 1859, the daughter of a solicitor. At the age of 17, she began training as a nurse at Tottenham Hospital. In 1877, aged just 18, she went to Bulgaria with a group of volunteer nurses to treat Russian casualties of the Russo-Turkish War. Now, the Russians and the Ottoman Empire didn't get on with each other, and this was the 11th of 12 Russo-Turkish Wars, and one of the shortest. It lasted just over 10 months, ending with a victory for the Russian coalition at the beginning of March 1878. And it was in Bulgaria that Kate experienced leprosy sufferers for the first time. And this was to have a significant effect on her later life. She returned to Britain in 1878, first taking up a nursing post at Westminster Hospital and subsequently becoming assistant superintendent at a convalescent home in Liverpool. She resigned after four years due to ill health feeling, sorry, fearing that she might have TB. After two years, she had recovered sufficiently to answer a plea for help from her sister Annie in Wellington in New Zealand. And in October 1884, Kate and her mother boarded a ship bound for New Zealand, arriving there three months later in January 1885. Within a week of their arrival, Kate's sister Annie died of TB. Kate stayed on in New Zealand, having decided the climate would enable her own health to fully recover. She successfully applied for a post of nursing superintendent at Wellington Hospital. At first she settled in well, but within a few months, she was involved in a conflict between patients nursing staff and doctors. A small group of female patients made a written complaint about a Dr Chilton saying he was rude and had been drunk on duty on at least one occasion. Kate sided with the patients and said that either she or Dr, Ch Dr. Chilton should leave. As a result he was asked to re resign and he said he'd think about it. As he hadn't responded, two days later he was dismissed. Staff protested in support of the doctor and 10 nurses submitted a written complaint about Kate saying she had lied about the doctor and they asked for her resignation. They were supported by nine male staff members. After an inquiry, Dr. Chilton's dismissal was confirmed. The 10 nurses were dismissed and the male staff members were given one month's notice. In September 1885, Kate had a serious accident. She fell off a stepmother, suffering a serious back injury. She was confined to bed for several months, and in December, it was obvious that she, she would not be able to continue as nursing superintendent. But she later recovered sufficiently to start traveling around New Zealand 
giving lectures. In 1889, the plight of lepers in various parts of the world was reported in the press, with particular reference to a colony forcibly quarantined on Molokai, which is one of the Hawaiian islands, and they were being looked after by Damien, a Belgian priest. Reading the reports, Kate was reminded of the plight of lepers she had seen in Bulgaria. She would have liked to have joined Father Damien's small team on Molokai, but as she was not a Catholic, this would not be possible. And incidentally, she converted to Catholicism a few years later. Kate heard about the plight of 250,000 lepers in India and decided that was where she would like to go. But then the Russian Red Cross invited her to St. Petersburg to receive a medal for her wartime work. Before her departure, she had an audience with Korea. A few days later, she accepted an invitation for an audience with Princess Alexandra, who had heard about Kate from the Queen. After their meeting, Princess Alexandra gave Kate a personal letter of introduction to the princess's sister, the Russian Empress Maria Fyodorovna. Both were from the royal, uh, the Danish royal family. Kate arrived in St. Petersburg in April 1890 and had an audience with the Empress at a palace in Gachina, a few miles south of St. Petersburg. Kate explained that she wanted to learn all she could about leprosy, including its cause and to seek remedies. The Empress was surprised to learn that there were cases of leprosy in Russia, but she gave Kate a letter of introduction to the authorities of the hospitals and leper settlements throughout the Russian Empire. After receiving her medal and visiting a few hospitals, Kate returned to London and began to plan another journey to study leprosy in Russia, Palestine and Turkey. She visited Louis Pasteur in Paris to see if he had any information about a vaccine for leprosy. He hadn't. In London, she visited Florence Nightingale, who wished her well on her mission. And Kate spent several months traveling and studying leprosy. Her travels eventually brought her to Constantinople, that's today's Istanbul, where she heard of a rare Siberian herb that could supposedly treat or cure the disease. She had originally planned to go to India, but now thought it more important to go to Siberia to investigate the herb. In November 1890, Kate, armed with her letter from the Empress, arrived in Moscow and presented herself to the Governor General, Prince Vladimir Androvich Dolgorokov. Then she, she headed to St. Petersburg again for further discussion with the Empress. She returned to Moscow and in February 1891, she and a Russian-speaking friend, Ada Field, set out for Siberia. So let's just stop for a while and consider the journey that Kate was about to make. A, a brief geography lesson here, if you like. Now, Moscow, I believe, is here on the map. I hope you can see my pointer. And Yakutsk, she had to travel all the way to about here. Um, you can see this area in more detail down the bottom right. But it wasn't just a, a straight journey. She was going up and down all over the place. Now, Moscow and Yakutsk are 5,000 miles apart. And it was midwinter when Kate and her friend started out. Many people said it was an impossible journey for a woman. But Kate was determined. But why did they start the journey in winter? It was expected to take about five months to get to Yakutsk, and it would be much better if she was at her destination in the warmer weather. The Republic of Sakha, that you see down here, or Yakusha, 
as it uh, can also be called, is the largest administrative and territorial subdivision in the world and the largest part of the Russian Federation, as you can see from its size up here. It occupies about one fifth of the territory of Russia and within its borders, you could fit Germany, France, Austria, Italy, Finland, Greece and Sweden. Now, don't ask me why those seven countries have been selected. That's, uh, I'm just repeating what I found on the official Yakusha website. And 99% of all the diamonds produced in Russia come from mines in Yakusha. That equates to 25% of the world's diamond production. In today's modern world, if you were to travel between Moscow and Yakutsk, on reasonable roads, clear of snow and ice, using a sat-nav and maintaining an average speed of 60 miles an hour, it would take you over four days non-stop. For Kate, of course, much of the, for much of the route, there were no ro roads. There were no navigation aids and plenty of snow and ice. But at least for the first part of the journey, she, she could go by train but not for most of the route because the now well-known Trans-Siberian Railway was still at its planning stage. She started her journey on the 1st of February, 1891, traveling by train to Zlatust, a distance of 1,000 miles, one fifth of the whole route from Moscow to Yakutsk. As the Empress had said that Kate should be given every assistance, she was welcomed by officials. And at the time, Zlatust had a population of about 20,000 and was one of the main iron producing cities in Russia. Kate would have seen the great Zlatust church dedicated to St. Maximian. It was closed in 1920 as a result of the revolution, destroyed in 1930, and replaced by statues of Lenin and Stalin. Now here's Kate in her clothing, her clothes. Note the Red Cross armband, which she always uh, prominently displayed. She was remarkably well equipped for the very cold Siberian climate. She said she had a whole outfit of Jaeger, or Jaeger, however you want to pronounce it, but Jaeger, garments. Now, known for its high fashion in modern times, the company originally known as Dr. Jaeger's Sanitary Woolen System Company Limited was established in 1884, specializing in woolen long johns and other undergarments. Ernest Shackleton wore Jaeger clothing on his Antarctic expedition. And incidentally, Jaeger went into administration in 2017, and the brand name is now owned by Marks and Sparks. Here's a close up of Kate in her clothes. And, and this is a description, her description of what she wore when traveling. I had a whole outfit of Jaeger garments, which I pride, prized more as the months went on than a loose kind of body line very thick elder down ulster with sleeves long enough to cover the hands entirely, the fur collar reaching high enough to cover the head and face. Then a sheepskin reaching to the feet and furnished with a collar which came over the fur one. Then over the sheepskin I had to wear a dacca, which is a fur coat of reindeer skin. A long thick pair of Jaeger stockings made of long hair and over them a pair of gentlemen's thickest hunting stockings. Over them a pair of Russian boots made of felt coming high up over the knee, and over them a pair of brown felt Valenkis. And Valenkis are Russian snow boots lined with lamb's wool. Now with all that stuff on, I hope she didn't have to make too many comfort stops on the way. But uh, here is Kate, you can see her in the bottom right hand cor <coughs> corner on her sledge because from Zlatust, Kate and her friend Ada would have to travel by sledge. 
they describe the difficulties of sledge transport. These are her words. Bump, jolt, bump, jolt over huge frozen lumps of snow and into holes and up and down those dreadful waves and furrows made by the traffic. Your head seems to belong to every part of the sledge. It is first bumped against the top, then the conveyance gives a lurch and you get an, an, an unexpected knock against the side. Then you cross one of the ruts and first you are thrown violently forward against the driver and second, you just as quickly rebound. At most of the towns they stopped on at on route, they would visit hospitals and prisons. And eventually they arrived at Omsk, having covered about one third of their journey, just 1,700 miles from Moscow completed and about 3,400 miles to go. Omsk was and still is the main city of Western Siberia. One of the oldest churches in Omsk is St. Nicholas Cathedral built in the 1830s and it's still in use today. At Omsk, Kate visited the military hospital and the prison, reporting both as being in excellent condition. But her friend Ada Field, who had accompanied Kate this far, was too ill to continue any further with her. So Kate would be left with no English speaking people for the rest of her journey. Fortunately, a Russian army sergeant accompanying her had some understanding of French, as did Kate, so that was of some help. From Tomsk, travel to Tomsk, about 550 miles, arriving in April 1891, and from there she went a further 500 miles to Krasnoyarsk. Here's a busy part of Krasnoyarsk, about how Kate would have seen it. There she reported that the prison was in admirable condition, well managed with good ventilation and proper sanitary provisions. The photograph shows a number of horse-drawn carts, which I imagine were used just for local journeys. And the next part of Kate's journey would take her to Irkutsk, about 660 miles from Krasnoyarsk. Excuse me while I just have a sip of water. The start of April, so she was relieved not to have to travel any further by sledge. Instead, she would use a horse-drawn carriage, but something a little more substantial than those in the picture. She would use a Siberian Tarantas, it's a four-wheeled horse-drawn vehicle on a long frame, allegedly to reduce jolting on long distance travel. The frame supports a large basket. There are no springs and usually no benches to sit on. The interior is just covered by straw, changed at intervals for cleanliness, upon which the passengers rest. Kate's description of her experience in such a vehicle is, now this vehicle was never designed for comfort, is innocent of a single spring. It runs on wheels and stands a long way from the ground, making it awkward for a woman to get in without assistance. The roads at this time of the year are in a terrible condition, a ploughed field, continue containing a good many deep ruts is the nearest description I can give of them. And when a traveler thinks he's going to glide along in tolerable ease, he suddenly bumps down through the ice into a great hole of sticky, pulpy mud. She reached Irkutsk in very poor condition. She eventually felt well enough to continue and set off again in a Tarantas heading for Yakutsk, nearly 2,000 miles away. So here you see Krasnoyarsk, here you see Irkutsk, and she is traveling from there up to Yakutsk, a distance of, I think, as I just said, about 2,000 miles. It doesn't look it on this map, but 
That's what it is. Now, from Krasnoyarsk to Irkutsk, she traveled um, about 660 miles. Um, sorry, yeah, sorry, she, she traveled by Tarantas, yeah, 660 miles there. But then from Irkutsk, she traveled another 200 miles by Tarantas to the river Lena. And there she transferred to a cargo barge to take her to Yakutsk. These barges are very basic, but there's no bumps with them. She arrived in Yakutsk in June 1891, having taken three weeks to complete the journey from Irkutsk and five months after leaving Moscow. Kate went to see Maliti, the Bishop of Yakutsk, and, he, and she learned from him that there were no proper facilities for lepers in the district. But he also confirmed the existence of the herbs she was seeking and gave her samples. She was, in, she was advised that to get to the leper colony, she would first have to travel to Vilyusk, about 500 miles away, and then a similar distance to the leper encampment. There were no roads, so the only way to travel was on horseback, and they set out from Yakutsk on the 22nd of June, 1891. She was accompanied by 15 men and 30 horses. In those days, ladies usually rode side saddle, but because of the distance and the terrain, that was not practicable. Their route had been marked out for them through forests, bogs, and over rocky. A three month supply of food. Most nights they camped in tents they'd taken with them and they were plagued with mosquitoes. At times they slept in what Kate described as disgustingly filthy yurtas, swarming with vermin of many kinds. When she arrived in Vilyusk, she was met by Father John Vinukorov, who was devoted to the lepers. She learned of the terrible conditions in which the lepers lived, and her little group then set off again on horseback to cover the remaining 500 miles or so to the leper encampment. When she arrived, she was shocked by what she found. The lepers lived in total destitution and misery. She met 80 lepers living in a few filthy, vermin-ridden yurtas. It dawned on her that if in Yakusha there was a herb that cured leprosy, it was not being used. By the time she was ready to start her return journey, she was determined to improve the situation for the lepers and decided to raise funds to provide a location for a civilized home for these poor outcasts. On her return journey through Siberia, she began raising the money for a colony where the lepers could be properly cared for. Her journey back was a little easier and she was pleased to find her friend Ada Field waiting for her at Tomsk. She spent time in Moscow and St. Petersburg raising money for the new colony. And before she returned to England, she had raised the 90,000 rubles required. It was planned that the colony would comprise 10 houses for 10 lepers in each, two hospitals, one for men, one for women, a church, a house for a doctor and two assistants, a house for nurses and other staff of the colony, a workshop, a bathhouse, and a mortuary. The first part of the new colony was opened and consecrated on the 5th of December, 1892, just a year after Kate's visit. The whole complex was completed six years later. In 1902, there were 76 patients at the hospital. By 1917, there were just 19. 
and it eventually became a psychiatric, psychiatric hospital and later a boarding house because it was not required for lepers anymore. Kate had fundraising tours in England and America, and her book on sledge and horseback to outcast Siberian lepers was published in 1893. You can still get copies of the book. Um, I think there's a few of the original around, but uh, it has been published again. But in fact, uh, the Welcome Institute, which is uh, in Marylebone Road in London, have actually uh, made it available online. Um, but uh, if you want to start reading, I think it goes to about 350 pages, uh, but uh, it is available. Kate was elected to fellowship of the Royal Geographic Society, which was quite a rare achievement in those times for a woman. And in 1895, she converted to Catholicism. She was instrumental in founding the St. Francis Leprosy Guild in October 1895. The guild is still active throughout the world, even using modern antibiotics to treat the disease. There are still an estimated 200,000 people diagnosed with leprosy every year. But what about the legendary herb she went in search of? She later claimed that she did find it, but was vague about the details, saying only that it's not a cure for leprosy, it only alleviates the suffering. It may have been a local herb called kuchutka. Locals mixed it with other herbs and sometimes vodka. I've been unable to find a picture of it. In 1914, Kate was living in Bexhill on Sea and was a co-founder of their Museum of Natural History in that year. It's still there and it has displays relating to Kate. She spent most of her later life within, living with two spinster sisters, not her sisters, two sisters, Alice and Emily Norris in their house called The Rest in Blossom Way, Hillingdon. The sisters were daughters of George Norris, the rector of a village of the village of Blownorton in Norfolk. He had died in 1898, aged 63. For many years, Kate was not a well person and the sisters looked after her. But she died on the 26th of March, 1931, age 72. Now, some of the reports I've read online and the obituary in our local paper said she died in the house in Blossom Way, Hillingdon. No, she didn't. She died at Springfield House in Beechcroft Road, Wandsworth. The cause of death is shown as senile decay, which is the natural process of old age. As far as I've been able to ascertain, Springfield House was a section of Springfield Mental Hospital, but was for voluntary patients. She was buried in a grave owned by the Norris sisters. After her death, one of the Norris sisters presented to the Royal Geographic Society the watch and whistle that Kate used in Siberia, and also a large, large framed portrait of Kate in court dress signed by her and dated 1906. And that was placed in the ladies smoking room of the Royal Geographic Society. Alice Norris died in 1937 and Emily in 1945. And they were buried in the same grave as Kate, but the grave had no headstone. There are two British people with a very keen interest in Kate Marsden. They are Jackie Hill Murphy and another lady who became interested because of her name, Kate Marsden. No relationship to the original. But this Kate used to live in Berkshire, but now resides in the Channel Islands. Each of those, these two ladies made separate journeys to Yakutsk and were welcomed by the local people. So they know far more about Kate than I do. 
and Jackie Hill Murphy has had a book published about her journey. And when I was in touch with Kate Marsden a couple of years ago, she was also writing a book. In 2014, these two ladies got together with a number of young people from Viliusk. They all met at Uxbridge Station and they went to the cemetery. They'd already identified the whereabouts of the unmarked grave and their objective was to clear it of the brambles and ivy that had grown over it. In this picture, it's the grave furthest away. And this is after clearing it and placing on it a photo of Kate. The people from Siberia then performed a religious shaman ceremony in honor of Kate. And little did they know that five years later, there would be another ceremony at the grave to perform the consecration of a new, a new monument to Kate. Here you see the new headstone, which includes a ceramic photo of Kate on her, on her Yakut horse. The inscriptions on the headstone are in three languages. The first in the local Saka or Yakut language, and its translation is deep gratitude, unfading through the ages. The second in English reads eternal gratitude from the people of Vilius Ulis, Saka Republic, Yakusha. The third very short inscription is in Russian. It simply says memory eternal. But Kate was buried in the grave owned by the two Norris sisters. And eventually each of the sisters came to be buried here in the same plot, never marked by a headstone until this ceremony in 2019. So the rear of the headstone is deservedly dedicated to Alice and Emily Norris, the two sisters who looked after Kate through her illness in later life. I'm so grateful that uh, we were allowed to attend this ceremony for Remarkable Lady. So thank you all for listening. I hope you agree with me that Kate Marsden was a remarkable lady and we now know more about her. If you want to find out even more, just enter her name on Google and you'll be surprised at the amount of information available. Thank you, everybody, for listening.